Okay, so welcome to this next video in which we are discussing tetanus neurotoxin and how it works. Okay, right, so let's just have a brief discussion of the bacterium which secretes uh, tetanus neurotoxin. So let's draw it here. It's the star of the show. It is Clostridium tetani. Now, clostridial species, all clostridial species, are anaerobic bacteria, which means that they like to live in conditions where there is no, or at least very low, oxygen. They do not like oxygenated conditions. Okay, so Clostridium tetany actually lives in the soil. It lives in soil. And um, basically, you can, if you have a cut and you're digging in soil, then you can potentially get uh, infected with Clostridium tetany. And if you do, uh, usually what you get is spores of Clostridium tetany, which then, in the um, anaerobic conditions of your cut, uh, are going to um, are going to well, they're going to return into the active Clostridium tetany bacterium. Then they're going to divide and they're going to start producing um, tetanus toxin. Okay, so that's how generally you catch Clostridium tetany. It's why, um, you know, a great way of catching it would be um, some horrible metal, um, you know, if you were trying to dig something metallic out of the ground and then you cut yourself on this rusty metal or something, that would be generally a way of catching tetanus. Um, or a nail or something, if you, got to, if you stood on a nail or something. Uh, generally, you don't get the active Clostridium tetany originally, what you get is the spores of Clostridium tetany which can survive in aerobic conditions. So uh, the spores of Clostridium tetany go into your cut and then in the deep parts of the cut uh, the conditions can be pretty anaerobic and the spores can then return to active Clostridium tetany bacterium and those will start producing the, clost uh, well, the toxin, tetanus toxin. Okay, so the other thing to say about Clostridium tetani is that it's a gram-positive bacterium, which means that if you stain it with the gram-staining mechanism, you will see a b blue bacterium under the microscope. And the important actual, what that means in terms of the structure of the bacterium, is that it has a very thick cell wall, shown here in blue, um, and only one membrane. So it has a cell membrane, it does not have an outer membrane, which gram-negative bacteria would have. So it is a gram-positive bacterium. Okay, so that's a little bit of an introduction to Clostridium tetany. I don't think the video will be complete without a little discussion of him. Uh, okay, so it's going to produce this um, tetanus neurotoxin. So out from the Clostridium tetany comes this tetanus neurotoxin. And it's basically what's known as an AB toxin, okay? So it's an example, basically, of what's known as an AB toxin, or exotoxin would be the even uh, more, uh, even better way of saying it. Uh, so it has these two subunits. This B subunit here, so this is the B subunit, which is also sometimes referred to as the heavy, um, heavy subunit, so the heavy subunit, Okay, and we'll cover that in. Oh, whoops! We'll cover that. Cover that in orange. Okay, so in orange here we have the heavy subunit of our tetanus neurotoxin that has been secreted, and then it also has the A subunit here, this smaller subunit here, A subunit, which is also known as the light subunit or the light chain, which is equal to the light subunit. Okay, right. So together they are the tetanus neurotoxin. So I will colour in the A subunit in pink. Okay, right. So uh, what's going to happen is uh, this neurotoxin, this tetanus neurotoxin, is going to bind to axon terminals, basically. It's going to bind to ganglioside in axon terminals of alpha motor neurons. Okay, so let me show this happening. So, remember the alpha motor neurons are the neurons innervating muscle cells. Okay, so let's draw an alpha motor neuron here. So let's say this is an alpha motor neuron here. Okay, what this um, tetanus uh, neurotoxin is going to bind to is a 
certain constituent of the cell membrane of alpha motor neurons. And uh, this constituent is what's known as a ganglioside. Now, the two gang it can bind to one of two ganglioides. One of them is the GD1B ganglioside, or it can also bind to the GD2 ganglioside. So one of those two ganglioides is what it's going to bind to. Okay, so this is the ganglioside molecule in the um, in the membrane of the. Um, of this um, axon terminal, of this mo motor neuron. So this is an alpha motor neuron. Okay, so I'm just going to do a little bit of a discussion of what a ganglioside is. So these are, these are ganglioides, and it's basically one of those words that people never actually know what it actually is. So I want to tell you what a ganglioside actually is. Now, in order to tell you what a ganglioside is, I need to tell you what a glycosphingolipid is. And in order to tell you what a glycosphingolipid is, I need to tell you what a sphingolipid is. And in order to tell you what a sphingolipid is, I need to tell you what a ceramide is. And in order to tell you what a ceramide is, I need to tell you what sphingosine is. So we'll start off with what sphingosine is. Okay, so sphingosine then. Sphingosine. Now, the uh, sphingosine is the name for a molecule, basically, a certain molecule, and it's the biochemist's name. The proper chemistry name for this is 2-amino, 2-amino, 4-octadecene, octadecene, 1-3-diol. Okay? Right. So... The nice thing about the biochemist name is that it's short. The nice thing about the chemist name is that it tells you exactly how to draw the structure of this molecule out. So we can see which carbons are important. We can see that the molecule overall has 18 carbons. Now, we don't need to draw all 18 out because only the first, the second, the third, the fourth, and then the fifth uh, are important, basically. And you might be asking, how do I know the fifth is important? Well, this is decene, so it has a double bond. And the double bond is off the fourth carbon. So, it must go from the fourth to the fifth carbon. So, we're going to at least have to draw out the fifth one. So, let's draw out five carbons initially. One, two, three, four, five. And now, let's put these structures on. So, we have an amino group off the second carbon. So, here's an amino group of the second carbon. Okay, we have hydroxyl groups of the third and f first and third carbons. So let's put those on, first and third. Okay, and then we have a double bond uh, from the fourth to the fifth carbon. So there we go. And those are the only interesting structures. So two amino is this. One free dial is here and here. 4-octadecene is here. Now what we need to do is make sure we actually have 18 carbons and uh, saturate all the other bonds with hydrogens. Okay, so what will happen next is you will have 12 um, methylene groups because if we think about how many carbons this molecule overall has, it has 18. Now we've drawn out 5 of them so far. Okay, so there are 13 left. The final one will be a methyl group, but all the other 12 will be methylene groups. Now, I do not want to have to draw out uh, 12 methylene groups, so there is a trick, basically. What I can do is bracket round one methylene group and then say, repeat this 12 times. So that means do this 12 times uh, for me, basically, so that I don't actually have to write them all down. And then this final one, it won't be a methylene group, it'll be a methyl group, so I have to then draw that out. Okay, so that's a handy trick for avoiding a lot of work. Right, uh, so let's just check we overall do have done it right, that we have 18 carbons. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 12 makes 17, uh, 18 there, so that's brilliant. Now we just need to finish this portion of the structure off by adding hydrogens onto the uh, free bonds. So we have hydrogens off each of these two carbons. We need a hydrogen off there, hydrogen off this second carbon, and then hydrogens off this first carbon. And that now is the structure of 2-amino, 4-octadecene, 1-3-diol, or sphingosine. Right, so now let's discuss how we turn 
sphingosine into a ceramide, okay? So a ceramide is a molecule that is based on sphingosine. So to make a, sphinc a ceramide sorry, from a sphingosine molecule, what you need is a carboxylic acid. So let's take carboxylic acid here. Okay, and what you need to do is form an amide link between the carboxylic acid and this amino group of the sphingosine molecule. Okay, so if I draw out this amino group of the sphingosine molecule, all that's going to change, basically, is that we're going to take a proton off this amino group, we're going to take the hydroxyl group off this carboxylic acid, and we're going to bind this carboxylic acid to the amino group in a amide link, basically, and it will be a condensation reaction, so it'll produce water. Right, so now that molecule is a ceramide, and you'll notice that I have not specified for you what this R group is. It can be anything. So a ceramide is not a specific molecule. Sphingosine is one molecule. There is no, there's no variation on that. There's no freedom. Ceramides uh, are not one molecule. They're a whole class of molecules. They're an infinite class of molecules. You can have whatever R group you like there. Okay, right. So, next then. How do you get a sphingolipid from a ceramide? So a sphingolipid is a modified ceramide. So you start off with a ceramide, which is a, a sphingosine molecule with a carboxylic acid bound to the, second, the amino group of the second carbon. Now to turn it into a sphingolipid, what you do is you turn your attention to this group. You've already added the group off this. Now you're going to turn your attention to this first hydroxyl group. And what you're going to do, basically, is you're going to stick another arbitrary group off that hydroxyl group here. So what will happen is you'll get something like this. So this is the start of the sphingosine molecule. And now you've added an arbitrary group off that hydroxyl group. And that's what's known as a sphingolipid. Now, a glycosphingolipid then. A glycosphingolipid means that this second R group, this R prime group here, um, this, and I'm just denoting it as R prime, by the way, because I've used R over there, so I didn't want to put it twice, because people might think that I meant the same R group. Uh, that's just denoting I mean a different group, potentially. You could have the same one. It's not against the rules, but it doesn't necessarily have to be the same. Okay. Now, a glycosphingolipid means that this second R group, this R prime group, is sugary in origin. It's made out of sugar molecules. Okay. And a ganglioside is a specific type of glycosphingolipid. So it's a specific type of... Um, it well, it's, it's got a specific sort of sugar group off here. So that's what these molecules are, basically. That's some intuition as to what these molecules actually are. So GD1B and GD2, they are these modified versions of sphingosine that are sitting in the phospholipid by there of our uh, axon terminal. Okay, now, uh, what's going to happen is that our uh, tetanus neurotoxin, this AB toxin, is going to come along here, and it's going to bind to that uh, ganglioside there. So let me show it here. So the heavy chain, I can't remember what colours I denoted them on on the other side. So the heavy chain is now in orange, or the B chain is in orange. And the reason it's called B, by the way, is for binding, because it's the portion that binds to the receptor. And the light chain, or the A chain, is in pink. Okay, now what's going to happen is you're going to get clathrin-mediated endocytosis, and it's going to go into uh, the um, axon terminal of this neuron. Okay, so here's the, uh, the ganglioside, still bound to the B um, chain, and here's the A subunit here. So let me colour it in so that we know where we are. So in pink we have the A subunit, or the light chain, and in orange we have the heavy chain, or the B subunit. And in blue we then have the GD2, or the GD1B ganglioside. Okay, and we'll continue this discussion in the next video.